Hello. Right, uh, this is a first for me, I think. Uh, this is a viewer request video. Um, a chap called Dean Harris Martin has asked me to um, give some suggestions on starting a workshop, uh, particularly for doing blacksmithing, metalworking um, kind of stuff. Uh, he's asked about um, hand tools and about machinery. And I thought it was a good chance to um, tell you about the machinery that I bought when I first started out doing metalwork many years ago. And you should be able to see some of it behind me here. So if you've seen any of my videos where I'm making stuff, uh, this corner of the workshop will be quite familiar already. Um, when I started working for myself, as opposed to working for a, the blacksmithing company where I started out, when I started for myself I had a toolbox of tools, one of those cantilever toolboxes, and I had an arc welder, a really, a really nasty arc welder, um, which about the same size. And I used to go to work to my workshop in town um, in a little Ford Fiesta, which for those of you overseas is a midget sized car. And in the Ford Fiesta I had my toolbox, my welder and my giant dog. Um, and that was all the tools I owned in those days. So you don't need a lot to start out with. Um, as soon as I moved to a bigger workshop, I wanted to expand and the first big job, really big commission I got, I spent the whole deposit on machinery and the three machines that I bought, and I bought them new, which is not necessarily something I'd, I'd uh, recommend, but it worked out well for me at the time and I bought a sander, a uh, pillar drill or drill press, whatever you want to call it, and at the end of all this racking you should be able to see a bandsaw, a metal cutting bandsaw. Now here in the UK we have a company called Axminster Power Tools and it's their brand that's on these three, the first three machines that I bought and they call them Axminster White. Now this is a, it's a fairly universal recommendation this because these are just Chinese tools but they're sort of high-end Chinese if you like. And over the last 15 odd years or so the choice of what you can get from China now has really come on an awful lot from what it was back in the day when if you saw made in China on something you just knew it was going to dissolve away. These tools, so this sander, the drill press and the bandsaw there, I've had for about 15 years and they were quite budget machinery when I got them but they really have stood the test of time. So in this country, Axminster, back then, I mean I haven't bought anything from them for, for about a decade, but yeah, at least 15 years ago, and presumably still, um, they were picking Chinese stuff to put their brand on that really was actually quite good quality. And I've been really happy with this. I mean, you know, over the years I could have upgraded many times if I wanted to, but I haven't. I've stuck with this stuff because it works. Um, let me think. No, no, it hasn't broken down at all, any of this. So the sander, the drill press and that bandsaw have worked really hard for me. Um, they've earned me an awful lot of money and um, they've been great. The other really important thing for the machinery is a little bench grinder like this. Obviously this one's not a bench on the shelf, but that's what it's called. This one was a cheapy from Screwfix. Uh, I think this cost £15, although well, it was a long time ago. It's still going strong, and I use that for sharpening drill bits. Something I may cover in some other video, although there's probably plenty of videos on YouTube already, is the importance of sharpening drill bits when you're drilling through steel. So, I've got my drill press here. I've got my drill bits here. So I've got from 1mm up to 13mm, and then I've got 14mm up to 25mm at the top there. And on the other side of the drill press, right to hand, is the bench grinder. So I can drill with something, and if it starts to dull, and you can hear when it starts to dull, um, I'll take it straight out, and it's zip zip in there, and we're good to go. I've never found any need for a jig or anything like that, it's just, yeah, you know what you're looking for, it's a couple of seconds. Same as keeping an edge on a knife, if you, if you, keep the edge to begin with then you don't have to laboratory sharpen it um, every few months and it's the same with these so just zip zip off we go slightly closer look at the sander then 
this is actually sold as a woodworking sander as I mentioned in my I think it was a knife making video this runs slower than most metal working linishes but that's fine because I'm you know really in a hurry these days um, it uses belts that like this and again this is these belts are not as long but much wider than a lot of people using um, metal working stuff again they work fine for me so I'm happy with them it's got a nice hefty motor right here not much more to say <laughs> it's been um, yeah boringly reliable which is how you want your machinery moving on to the drill press then this is similar similar sort of power one of the reasons I haven't upgraded to any bigger stuff is one I don't do bigger jobs anymore um, and for two I'm running this whole workshop most of the time like today um, purely off of solar power and my inverter that provides the mains power can only cope with a two kilowatt motor so there's no point having a, a monstrous drill press um, it would just use more power than I've easily got available and I don't want to be starting out with a big diesel generator every time I want to drill a hole in something. Moving on then, this is a 1950s, I think this lathe is. And I got this for scrap value, I think I paid 40 quid for this. Um, and it's, yeah, it's radically useful. I don't use it every day, but when you need a lathe, that's what you need. So, yeah, nice bit of kit. This is an extremely old bench grinder that um, my mum bought as a present for my dad when I was about that tall and yeah, somehow I inherited it and she painted it rather nicely in a canal boat styling. Still runs well actually. I put a wire brush on the other side which is very useful for cleaning up bits um, after they've been forged. Bits that are too small to clean up with a wire brush and angle grinder, which we'll get to in a bit. Continuing round then in the metal working area, this is my steel stock, and these are all the commonly used sizes. If the stock is over two meters long or so, it goes up on this rack. If it's below two meters, it gets stacked up, and then if it's short, short bits go in these cubby holes. And then at the end of the rack is the bandsaw. The bandsaw then is the last of the trio of machinery that I got from Maxminster to kick off with. And this is a metal cutting bandsaw, obviously. And this is um, what we call a horizontal bandsaw. So instead of it sitting upright and you're feeding in the stuff that you want to cut, like you do on a, on a wood bandsaw, this one, the actual saw moves. So you clamp what you want to do in there, and the saw drops down and cuts through it. <laughs> This bench is full of crap, but you can probably make out these rollers. And the rollers are there so I can get... Let's demonstrate it. So I can get down a piece of metal. It sits on the rollers above the bench. And then it rolls through into this vise. And then I can cut it. This is much slower turning than um, woodworking bandsaw. And let's that, just cram that in there. And that's what it's like in action. The really nice thing about the bandsaw, the thing I like about a bandsaw as opposed to a chop saw for cutting steel is that it's mellow is mellow the right word. It it'll do its own thing. So I can put that on there. If it's a massive lump of steel, it'll still cut through it, but I just set that going and yeah, it was supposed to have a spring or something to weigh it down. Anyway, I use a giant comedy spanner and I stick that in the end there as a weight and that just pulls it down. It means I can go and get on with something else Well, this just patiently cuts through by itself. I put in a little squirt of that with each cut. This is just cutting fluid, um, cutting and tapping fluid. And off it goes. I find for cutting stuff when it's flat in there or square stock or round solid stock it does a reasonable job. Uh, if I'm cutting box section or something like that 
because you've got a flexible blade it can wander so that's something to be aware of um, angle line can be a bit sketchy as well so you can either cut it slightly large and then square it off on the sander or other way to do it is to put the angle line in flat like that and cut through this bit and then flip it over and then cut it flat there and you get a nice square cut uh, I didn't really mention much there about welders apart from that I started off with that horrible um, cheap nasty um, AC arc welder it was that I started with um, as soon as I could as soon as I could afford it and I couldn't really afford it I, um, I bought this thing this is an inverter welder which at the time was like magic <laughs> they were really expensive they hadn't long come out um, this one I had to the guy at the welding store basically gave me a loan. Uh, I paid for this in instalments. Um, it was so expensive at the time. Well, I mean, it's a laughable amount now. I think it was five or six hundred pounds, something like that. But it seemed at the time when I was trying to start a business, that seemed like an awful lot of money. Um, so I had this with the welding leads. And um, yeah, I think I got a face mask and everything else as well. Um, this has been brilliant. It's still, still going strong now. So I got an arc welder because I was making I was doing a lot of restoration work. The bulk of my work was restoring um, Edwardian, Victorian, Georgian fire grates and other um, bits of metal work. I also did a lot of gate making and restoring of gates, other architectural metal work, that kind of stuff. So lumpy stuff. And this was this would cope with that. It'll only go up to 160 amps. But if you bevel into something, you can get in there and you can, you can, uh, you can weld thicker stuff with this. If you're going to mainly be working on an old car or a Land Rover like I do, you're going to need a MIG welder. And my advice there would be to buy a used one, a high quality used one. The thing is with MIG welders is the cheaper MIG welders have very poor wire feed mechanisms. And they will go wrong. And, yeah, I mean... I'm not going to get too into welders here, I might do a whole video just on welders. But I'll just say that it wasn't until I got a job as a professional welder using professional kit that I realised how easy it is to weld, to MIG weld, um, using an industrial welder. It's actually really quite hard to produce a really nice set of welding um, using the, the cheapest welders. Whereas a, a cheap inverter welder like this one, I mean this is relatively cheap, um, will do a really nice job in the thicker stuff. It's also very flexible, I can do cast iron with this, I can do stainless and I can even TIG weld with it, there's a TIG kit that I've got for this. Anyway, that's not really the, <laughs> the subject of this, this video. So that was a quick look at the machinery then. Um, what I'm going to show you now is a couple of the handheld power tools that I found essential for doing blacksmithing um, and other metalwork fabrication. We're going to start with the angle grinder. This is an angle grinder and this is not the one I started out with. I've been through many angle grinders. They are something that just it doesn't last no matter how expensive the angle grinder you get. But it is worth getting a quality one because a cheap one will destroy itself even quicker. Um, they've come on a bit. This is a, a Makita obviously. This is a nice light angle grinder. Not the most powerful one out there, but it is nice and light. You can use it all day long. Um, you'll notice there's no guard on it. And <laughs> now for me, I find it safer to operate without a guard. Now that might sound, sound counterintuitive, but you'll notice that on the drill press, there was no guard on that. And on the sanding um, machine, there's no guard on that. I like to know where the sparks are going. And I like to be able to get all the way around and see what I'm doing. I'm always wearing um, personal protective equipment, so anyway, it's a personal choice and for me, I take the guard off of this as I do with the drill press and the sanding machine. Um, yeah, and the bands will come to that. Anyway, so angle grinder. This is a cutting disc, a very thin cutting disc. I also use it with something like this, it's a grinding disc, and you can see that's much thicker. And I use it a great deal with this. So this is the uh, sanding pad. Oh, yeah, that goes like that. 
and this will do just about everything that the the big sanding machine will do. So um, this is a 36 grit here for taking metal away. I'd also use this with a 60 um, and 80 grits for cleaning stuff up. The other very useful accessory for an angle grinder is one of these. This is a really worn out one, but you'll see, you get the point. It's a wire brush, and this is very good for cleaning off the forge scale. Over in woodworking corner now, and I just brought you here to show you this thing. This is a mains power drill, and what it's sat in is a version of a drill press. So if you can't afford or you don't need a big drill press like the one I've got over there, this may well do the job for you. So I've covered there most of the machinery that I collected when I wanted to start doing this as, as a business um, on my own. What I'm going to do now is just um, briefly go over some of the more blacksmithing specific things. This then is one of the archetypal uh, blacksmith bits of equipment. It is of course an anvil. This is a particularly nice anvil and I would say probably my favourite tool in the whole workshop because this thing is very old. <laughs> this, this is wrought iron, it's a wrought iron anvil with a steel top on it and um, yeah, I think it's great. Quite a treasure. This is, you don't need anything like this to start off with and I didn't. I had um, a really horrible anvil to start off with. If I didn't have a horrible anvil I would have used something else. My suggestion if you want to have a go at blacksmithing is to try using one of these. So a sledgehammer and you can either use the head of a sledgehammer. So I've got one here that's waiting to be refurbished. And if you set that... So if you set this sledgehammer head on a, on a big stump of wood or, a, or on a, some hefty concrete, if you have that or whatever, um, that will make a reasonable substitute for an anvil to begin with. This would do the same thing for you, with the added bonus it still works as a sledgehammer. So along with some kind of anvil, you're going to need some kind of vice I would say fairly early on. This is a proper blacksmithing vice, this is a leg vice. This again is very very old, probably contemporary with the, with the anvil. While we're on the subject of hitting things, this is a fantastically useful bit of kit. This is actually a 56 pound weight. Um, not as common as they were, I'm sure, but still you can you can find these about. I use this then as a straightening block, and what that's for is when you buy stock metal like this bit here. This is a bit of what uh, um, 20 by 10. When you look down it, it's generally not quite straight, so you can identify the bit that's got a little kink in it, put it across here, and then you give it a whack with a copper hammer. Also very useful and you can see this in I've made a uh, video or two about cold forging where I do shapes in bits of metal that are just way too big to get into the forge and if it's mild steel you can put all kinds of curves in those using this. So if I put it between these two points and deliberately hit it there or even if it's on edge like that if I hit it there I'll put a little curve in it. So if I run it through hitting it all the way then I'll make a curve. Now I have um, rollers for making curves, but they can only make a simple curve, or at best that way and then a return. Whereas this, using this technique, I can make quite convoluted shapes. And uh, you can, I'll put up a link to the video where I, I do just that. So if you can find one, that's really good, really useful. And it's also heavy enough to be an anvil in its own right, um, before you want to go ahead and spend out on a proper anvil. If you can't find one of these, you can perform the same task by using the vise. If I wanted to straighten something then, using the leg vise, I would wind it out to give myself a bit of working room. So you can see the jaws on the leg vise open nice and wide. And then I can put that bit of stock across the jaws, and I can use the fact that it's supported here and here, and hit it between to straighten it out, or indeed to put those curves in again like I would be on the straightening block. There's not quite as much reactive mass in the leg vise as there is in the block, 
but it'll still get the job done. Slightly more common to find second hand than the leg vise then would be something like this, a big fat engineering vise. This has got its own little anvil on the back here. This is a particularly um, groovy one because it's got these rotating jaws for they will rotate inwards like that and they'll grip something that's round or you know not quite uniform. This used to be a quick release one but it's that doesn't work. But yeah, either way, something like this or the leg vise, you want a nice hefty vise will uh, will definitely pay dividends. This then is the area of the workshop where I get most of my blacksmithing done. So here I've got the anvil, I've got the leg vise, which is movable. The leg vise can be dragged around wherever I need it to be in the workshop. I've got the power hammer, which you're probably familiar with from its own video. Um, I've got a gas forge that I made here, we'll have a look at in a second. And I've got this big toolbox here. This is a, this is a recent um, acquisition. Uh, I did a big job last summer where I helped to make a massive sculpture. The money that I got from that paid for this and another big chunk of it on that DAF that you've probably seen in the Project Awesome videos. So this toolbox, so I went for the yeah, best part of 15 years or so without one of these, but having bought it, it's, it's great. I really like it. It's a lovely bit of kit. The, it's one of those things that the, the, the value for money has improved dramatically, I'd say, over the last 10 years. So this one is a Halfords brand one. I got it half price. I think they very often do a half price, half price thing on it. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't bother paying the full price. Um, I think this cost me about £400. And it was worth it. Definitely not essential. And I went for <laughs> over a decade without one. Um, but now I've got it. I enjoy it. Um, it. Yeah, not having one never held me back, definitely. But I do like being organised and that helps with that. Uh, let's have a look inside. I'm not going to go through the whole toolbox because most of it is, well, the top lot here is automotive stuff. Um, but here we have some blacksmithing things. And I'm just going to point out what I consider to be the most essential uh, items in here. This is a ball peen hammer, or an engineering hammer, some call it. That's a really good one to get to start off with. I'd also get the baby version of the same thing. I used a little one for mostly for hitting this to mark out where I want to drill things. So I'd say those two are the important ones, followed by this. The copper-headed hammer is really useful for hitting steel cold, particularly when you don't want to mark it. The copper being softer than the steel, um, that's how I can use the straightening block and get big curves and things without just covering them in, uh, in dinks from hammer marks. So very useful. It's also quite a dead blow as well, which has its, definitely has its place. And finally I'll mention this one. This is a baby cross peen hammer. This I used in the um, knife making video and it was really good for doing the blade because it's got such a nice round face on here and it was just light enough to uh, forge the bevels. If you're going to do blacksmithing you'll need some tongs. I have far fewer tongs in my arsenal than most uh, blacksmiths. Most of the time I use these. Sometimes I use these monster set. Occasionally I use these. Um, that tends to be about it really. So I've talked about the machinery that I got when I started out. Um, a couple of the handheld power tools, um, vices, and some of the blacksmithing equipment here. Um, before I go any further, I want to talk about um, personal protective gear, PPE. Now, <laughs> I guarantee a lot of people now are oh, boring, or a Nancy, but, and I used to be the same, I used to be quite blase about safety until I found myself in A&E more often than I wanted to be, and it wasn't just that, it was the epically long wait that you have 
when you're sat there in the hospital waiting to be seen because you've got something in your eye because you weren't wearing the right goggles or glasses or whatever. Um, despite that, I mean, I went for 10 years. In the course of 10 years, I had four times, four visits to the hospital where I couldn't get the thing out of my eye on my own. And they had to get it out. The worst one the, was a lump of cast iron, which actually subsequently broke up in my eye and started rusting and started making my vision go orange. It ended up being quite an interesting thing for the eye consultant because he took it out with a die grinder. This is a die grinder. <laughs> this is obviously a metalworking version. He had one that was battery powered, but identical in operation to this. And he had to numb my eye and then grind away at it until all the uh, bits of cast iron came out. Years later, I was having my eyes checked by an optician and I told him that story and he said, oh yes, I can see the scarring. And I was quite surprised there was scarring in my eyes because I thought your eyes renewed themselves, um, re renewed the layers of the eyes quite uh, often. And the optician told me that it's true, the outer layer of your eye does renew itself every 12 hours or so. But when you get a piece of metal from an angle grinder, embed itself in your eye, that goes so far in that it doesn't, it scars, doesn't heal up completely. And he drew my eyes out for me and he drew where these scars were that he could see. And he said, had that one that went in there been less than a millimetre lower down, I wouldn't be able to see out of that eye anymore. So, <laughs> something to think about. <laughs> this is what I consider to be the essentials for PPE. I'm also, in addition to this, <coughs> wearing riggers. Um, I tend to wear riggers at least half of the year. They're very good safety boots. They're not ideal because you can drop things down here, bits of burning metal, but um, it's not actually dangerous. It just makes you jump around a bit. Safety glasses. If they're wraparound safety glasses, I tend to wear these rather than goggles because these are, yeah, more easier to get on and off and they pretty much do the job. I've always been dead keen on ear defenders. Uh, these are a particularly nice pair. I find, apart from anything else, wearing ear defenders, I concentrate more and, and they keep my ears warm. So there's that. Welding gauntlets. These are very cheap to get and very useful. I tend not to actually use them for welding, interestingly enough. When I'm welding, I use rigger gloves like this. Most metal work, I'd wear these. If I'm messing with the actual forge, I tend to wear these ones. And finally, a respirator. This is the respirator I use for everything. Um, this is a vapour respirator, so this is particularly for paint spraying, but I use it for everything else because I figure if it's rated for paint vapour then it's going to be good for particulates as well. And I'd always get one of these over one of these. So this sort of dust mask affair doesn't really do a lot. And in fairness this one doesn't work brilliantly when you've got a beard, but uh, yeah it's better than nothing. So. That's brave. Oh, while we're at it, fire extinguishers. In the home and the workshop, <laughs> keep fire extinguishers to hand, because you never know. Um, yeah, I put out a few fires actually with fire extinguishers that could have um, got a lot more serious. Lastly then, I'm going to talk about forges. This is my coal forge, uh, which, well, let's, say coal, solid, let's call it a solid fuel forge. This is currently running on coke. So what these little bits here are. I also run it on charcoal and charcoal is much better but yeah, if you were to buy charcoal it would be prohibitively expensive to run it. Um, I used to make my own charcoal by the barrel load and once I move the kiln I'll be doing that again but for the time being it runs on coke. Now this is what you, I wouldn't say it's what you need but this is the, the best way I've found to get things up to really hot. So melting the steel kind of hot. But a lot of time that's not what you need. If you just want to do some forging of say a knife blade, you don't necessarily need to get it this hot unless you're intending to weld it. Increasingly then I'm using a gas forge and this is my current setup. It's almost embarrassingly simple. It's just a collection of fire bricks on a stand. And it works using this burner here. This is an ammo burner. You buy this section here and basically make the rest and that just goes on there there we go 
things where I don't need it to get that hot, this is just really convenient. And uh, you can see this is linked to this propane tank here. And here's a closer look at the same thing. So it's these, these actual fibre bricks came from a storage heater, so I didn't even pay anything for these. This, this is entirely built from <laughs> reclaimed materials, I suppose. This is the clever bit of the setup. This is a venturi chamber, so it squirts the gas in here through this little nozzle, the brass bit, and that draws in air. You can adjust this bit up and down to give it more or less air going in it, and that mixes as it swirls down through here, and um, yeah, works well. Behind it, incidentally, is um, an oxypropane setup. So that's a propane bottle and an oxygen bottle and they work together to come through this torch and you've probably seen this in other videos too. This is very very useful, far from essential and quite expensive to run for the oxygen. But very handy to have on, on call if I need it. So I'm not going to go on too much about all the various types of gas forge, um, just trying to give an overview here really. This works well for me. Um, the other, other ways of doing it, you can make a little half. If you've got some of the fire bricks or the soft fire bricks, which you can carve into, you can make a little version of this if you only want to do knives or something. And you can use a blowtorch with that instead of going and setting up this. These things are readily available, um, reasonably cheap. But if I was going to use a smaller burner, I'd go with something like this. These are available quite cheaply off eBay, which I think is where I got this one. And this is a roofing torch, and it makes a big flame out the end. I think this one came with three different um, burner heads on it. Is that a term? So you could set this up, and I, and I have done this, so you can cl clamp it pointing into um, a half made of fire bricks, sort of similar setup to this, for, this gas forge. And you probably get up to forging temperature there. If you could contain the heat a bit, uh, that would probably do the job. So yeah, consider that roofing torch kit. It's um, worth thinking about. So that about wraps it up for this video. I hope Dean, I've answered your question somewhere in all that talk. Um, I've not intended to give a comprehensive how to start a blacksmithing guide, just to give you an overview, maybe a flavor of the things to think about and things that worked for me when I started all those years ago. So the basics, if you're going to do actual blacksmithing, the very, very basics are um, fire, anvil and hammer. So we've covered the forges there. You can either make a gas forge like I've just shown you or uh, a coal forge you can make from a, a brake drum or a barbecue and a hairdryer. You know, there, there are, and there's plenty of videos out there showing you how to do these things. It's, there's, there's ways and means is basically what I'm trying to say. As, re, as regards an anvil, you can either get an anvil or get a sledgehammer or some other big lump of metal and you're on your way with that. And then for a hammer, just get a nice hefty engineering hammer like that. You'll find there's lots of things in life you can hit with a hammer and make them work, not just blacksmithing. So that's it for now. Thank you as always for watching. And I just want to say a special massive thanks to those that have donated via PayPal. Um, thanks in part to those donations. This morning I went and got this. Something I've been after for many, many years. Not the petrol can, the swage block. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to using that. I can feel like a proper blacksmith again. <laughs> so thanks for that. Another big chunk of the beer fund budget went on actual beer supplies. Uh, no doubt that'll be in a future video when we brew up a huge amount of Iron Fun Parale. So something to look forward to there. Well, for me anyway. I will at some point set up um, a Patreon account and a website and things like that when I feel the, the, the channel has, has grown big enough to warrant such things. Um, but for now though, the PayPal donations button is there if you feel the need and it's again hugely appreciated. And I'm sure you know from other creators grumbling about it, the ad revenue on YouTube has plummeted recently and so every bit of donation really does make a big difference and uh, it does inspire me to keep videoing the things that I do and editing them and putting them up for other people to watch. Um, 
while well, I'm in the mood for thanking people, I want to say uh, thanks to um, a friend of mine, Howard Taylor. Howard's been supporting our stuff here right from the start, and uh, he's got his own channel. Uh, Dubious Engineering is called. I'll put in a link somewhere on this video. And he does projects more electronically inclined than, than uh, the sort of things that I do. He's made a robot lawnmower. Um, he's made a crystal radio. And um, he's actually done a bit of blacksmithing. He, he did a, and, uh, an induction heater project, which is quite intriguing. Anyway, feel free to check him out. And uh, thanks for all your support, Howard. And uh, that about wraps it up for this time. See you on the next one. Cheers.